uh, I've been asked to give reflection. Uh, this is a, a time where the, the funeral or Tenjaku Mongkong Kiditana at Anjan Mahamon have the cremation tomorrow. And so many of the disciples of Lumpa Cha and Tanajan Maha Amon and in this tradition gather for this, uh, this ceremony of cremating his corpse. And uh, that's why funerals are an important part of our practice because we're all going to end up that way anyway on the pyre or in the grave. <laughs> so after that cheerful note, this is it's just uh, to remind yourself that, that, that uh, you know, there's respect for somebody who devoted his life for practicing meditation. Uh, he was, uh, he was a highly uh, regarded uh, Barietti monk in uh, in Uborn, when I came, when I arrived in uh, at Wat Papong in 1967, he was I, he wasn't at Wat Papong yet, but he was the following year he came, and it was quite a special event because uh, I mean I didn't understand all the implications or significance because I'm being a foreigner and not understanding the language. Uh, I didn't really become aware of how significant it was that one of the high regarded uh, Pramaha uh, Pali teachers in, uh, I think in Ban Nong Khun, wasn't it? They had a very good school for uh, training monks in Bariyate Dhamma. And, um, and of course, uh, there's always this division of the first uh, Wat Ba Wat Ban. Which didn't mean anything to me then either, but but uh, the, you know usually the what the what ban monks and the forest tradition monks were you know didn't have much contact, and uh, there was kind of a sense of strong views about variety, Bhattibhat and so forth. And so when Ajahn Mahamon came, it was. Uh, he said he was quite well known, high regarded, and he gave up his position as a teacher, and where he would have eventually probably been Jiao Kun, Jiao Kun, and Jiang Wat, and all the rest. He had the you know the intelligence and ability to uh, go high in the hierarchical structure of Thai Buddhism, but he gave it all up to practice with Ajahn Chah. So this was. And very few Bariyati monks would do that. I think Maha, Ajahn Mahasupom, who some of you might remember, he, he also came a couple of years later. And I remember Tanajan Mahamon always saying to me, you know, like one thing that uh, at that time uh, I was learning Thai and learning to read. Uh, Thai script and and the uh, uh, one teacher like Tenjo Kun Putatat in Suan Mok, he was he was quite controversial at the time, but very well known. And and they published uh, his his books and pamphlets. And Lumpa Cha really liked Ajahn Putatat's teaching. So so even though he didn't want you know, he asked me the, almost right off from the beginning to put away my books and not read anything for the wasp, for the pansa. And uh, he said, read your jit, read your mind, you know. So this was the teaching, is like, do jit, do arom. And this was the, you know, I had enough ability to understand Thai to get that point, but Buddha Tat was also a uh, highly, you know, kind of a genius scholar in those days and quite controversial. Like, he was published, uh, they published a book in Bangkok, uh, and it, and 
people were talking about this book called Dua Gu Kong Gu. And of course, I mean, I didn't see what, it didn't mean anything to me, but to Thai, this is like Dua Gu Kong Gu is, is actually me and mine, you know, the, the self view. But Gu, I think, is, is a rather coarse term or for a month to use or whatever. So, uh, Buddha thought like to to uh, really kind of stir things up a bit, getting Thai people to really, you know, look at themselves and and uh, trying to to uh, bring attention to the profundity of Patipatha or practice, meditation practice. And so there was at that time, you know, the two two months that I had most respect, interest in where uh, Lumpa Chao was my teacher, and then also Pugata. And so Tanajan Mahamon one day said, you know, before I practice meditation, I tried to read Buddha Tat's books, and I, they just didn't make sense to me, couldn't figure it out, it was nonsense. And he said, after meditation with Lumpa Chao, I suddenly started reading Buddha Tat and understand, <laughs> you know, because it like, if you're just on a Bariati level, uh, you know, the intellect, just knowing Pali and, and Buddhist philosophy and theory, that's one level, but Adnan Chao was, was uh, he'd always use the word Bhattibhat, Bhattibhat, you know, monks who, who practice. And uh, because of Thailand, is, you know, at that time, the Bhattibhat tradition was still rather remote. And uh, in 1967, 68, Thailand still, you know, they didn't have proper roads. And northeast Thailand, Isan, Ubon, was, was really, you know, most Thais never went, there, never came here to the Isan. And it was the Thai forest tradition, Ajahn Man and all that, was known by a few uh, people <coughs> that generally, the the, the Buddhism uh, of Thailand at that time was the Wat Ban, the, the village or the city or the Bariati Dhamma. And during these years, this 45 years ago, the, the, the power of uh, teachers like Lumpa Cha and Buddha Tha, uh, you know, just uh, their direct teaching. Buddha Tha was brilliant at the Bariati Dhamma, but also he was you know, he wasn't just a, a Bariati monk, he was a, also, you know, meditation was, was the way to, to develop Bariati Dhamma rather than just know Pali and, and keep, you know, know the scripture from the intellectual level. So this is, uh, not knowing anything about time and at the time, you, you know, it was uh, didn't under, didn't know what Thai Buddhism would be like, but my experience here has been, you know, my my direct experience was always uh, the, that I became very much aware of these very direct, very enlightened teachers uh, very quickly. You know, it's, uh, sometimes it amazed me when I think back because you know, a foreigner coming into a place where you can't speak the language and and a completely different culture from anything I'd ever experienced. Um, and then being able to tune in on this level uh, in the, in through the um, through being through actually putting into practice what the Buddha taught in the Bariatri Dhamma. And also the uh, the important, like Mungpa Cha and Buddha Tat, both, both were emphasizing Four Noble Truths as a way of practice. And I started out in Bangkok in a different style, you know, it was a kind of Vipassana style, Mahasi, Sayano style, but they never talked about Four Noble Truths at all, as I remember. And uh, so it was all about, you know, a, a kind of very strong method, which was quite helpful in the beginning. But Ajahn Chah was uh, always reflecting on the, these Four Noble Truths. And so this is, uh, and also Puddha put it in the, you know, was able to to attract, especially from the, you know, the university level, the educated classes, because of his, his kind of 
knowledge on, on that level. But Lung Po Char was also very, uh, you know, the, the Vinaya was very important. So, and, and in Sun Mok, it didn't seem to, you know, it didn't really talk about it much, or it didn't have the same emphasis, the same power that Lung Po Char placed on the, on the developing the Vinaya. And so, you know, it was through living with Ajahn Chah that I began to see the, you know, the value of how, you know, I used to wonder when, you know, the story in the scripture of when the Lord Buddha was passing on and then his disciple Ananda said, what are we going to do without our teacher when you're gone? And he said, I leave you the Dhamma Vinaya. Uh, you know, for a Western mind, the kind of Western mindset that I had was very much Dhamma, I really, you know, marvelous. But really, I couldn't see the point of it. When you started reading the Padi Moka from a Western mind and all these kind of little rules and, and uh, you know, the sense of offenses and, and that all seemed uh, superfluous to, to me in the beginning. But in, during the year I was a summonera before I met Ajahn Chah, I did have insight into the fact that if I was to develop, I needed a form, I needed uh, a structure to live in. Because like Dhamma, there's no structure to it. It's all, you know, it's letting go and, and being free from all grasping. And then uh, it, it isn't structured, it's, it's a very precise way to free the mind from delusion. But living your life in a, you know, because you have to live till you die, then you, you know, how are you going to do that just on Dhamma level? And I could see my own limitation coming from very kind of liberal uh, background where, where kind of rules and forms were, and traditions were kind of totally discarded and rejected and despised for the ideals of individuality, freedom, and follow your wishes, your desires. But I knew at the end of my seminary year I needed structure. I needed something to hold me down, to, to put boundaries on my behavior. So I had to learn how to conform. I was always proud of being a non-conformist. I was, when I was in university, I always considered myself a non-conformist. And, uh, and then to, to come into the Wapa Pong tradition where it was total conformity. <laughs> but yet I couldn't be, you know, by the time I came to meet Lung Po Chai, I was aware of need, the need for that. For something I had no control over, I couldn't, adapt it, change it, bend it to my own views. I had to fit in, and I knew that would be very difficult for someone who'd always prided themselves on being individ an individual and non-conformist. But it's through that, that kind of determination, the way that Lung Po Chao kept the Vinaya, it wasn't just keeping rules and threatening you with with eternal hell for breaking them, but it was always aligned with mindfulness, like to be able to bounce off these these boundaries and your own emotional resistances or views or opinions that you have, uh, to be able to see, you know, the the four noble truths in your in your own mind, and so you did have this sense of, of you know, that was the the rules were all about kind of, you know, moral precepts and then social etiquette and ways of doing things, prescribed ways of living with each other and uh, that was from, uh, you know, that we regarded as coming from the Lord Buddha himself. So it was through that training where, you know, that I began to see the why the Buddha when told Ananda, you know, I leave you the Dhamma of India. Because that's what we have, you know, 
the Buddha, the Lord Buddha, the the sage passed away 2,554 years ago, and so and by, we still have the Dhammalinya, and you can see here in Lanachan, and, and in the monasteries, uh, branch monasteries of Lumpachawa Kapong and so forth, this, this sense of Dhammalinya uh, as, a, as a way of developing, cultivating, and living. So, like Tanajan Mahamon was you know, began to really, you know, they had the Pariyati knowledge. He was very, you know, very clever, very intelligent man, gifted poet and writer, but uh, he didn't really get understand the essence of the heart of Buddhism until he started practicing it. So you've got this bari, Bariyati, Bhati Bhati, Bhati Vaiti, three things like that. This, this paradigm is one of, you know, you, you have the teaching of the Four Noble Truths as a Bariyati teaching, the Tamajaka Pavatana Sutta, and then, but it's always about putting it into practice. So you've got Bariyati is the kind of initial thing, then the, what do you do with this teaching and say there's uh, the first noble truth of suffering, there is suffering, there's dukkha, you can say, well, sir, there is. What do you do about it? And then uh, the Patipata understand, you know, to say that you, in a, that understanding then is is uh, is not, you know, I'm thinking I understand because I understand the word suffering or think I understand what dukkha is on the, you know, it's a common enough word in any language or any culture, but uh, this this sense of Understanding is is like really changing your attitude towards suffering, rather than just trying to run away from it, blame it on others, uh, endlessly seek for happiness and to get away from anxiety, fear, worry, and so forth. To to understanding, to understand something, you have to accept it for what it is. You can't just you know I don't want suffering and, and dismiss it. But it's taking it and learning from it. And so this is understanding suffering. And then the Bhati Vaiti, the third aspect of the First Noble Truth, is the result of that Bhati Bhata, of that practice. So this is, this is a paradigm of, ins of insight and reflection. In the, you know, in the Western mind, people living in, in the UK for so long, people don't like it. What do you mean by reflection? Because they want definitions, you know. What do you think dukkha really means? What is the exact English equivalent for the Pali word dukkha? And, and Bariyati monks get into real profound discussions about the ultimate and proper English translation of dukkha. But, uh, and which is all right, there's nothing wrong with that, but but it's not a matter of, of defining it, but of understanding it. It's this, you know, so you, you start observing your own sense of anxiety or dis-ease or worry or whatever, you know, it's just kind of mild doubt or unhappiness, or whether it's, you know, real anger, or rage, or jealousy, or greed, and whatnot. And so you're, you know, it's not a matter of the intensity, but of the understanding. It is the way it is. Also, it's important to recognize that, that intellectually you don't feel anything in life. You know, if you just live in your head and with definitions and and intellectual concepts, you don't feel life. You tend to operate from ideas about how things should be, make judgments about yourself or about others. But in the Bhakti Bhatta, you know, it's not, it's not uh, about, it's so the Bariyati has its purpose, but the Bhakti Bhatta is where we actually observe suffering. And not, you know, you can observe it as something external to you, but 
that's still that you said, if I got the point till you observe that that sense of loneliness or fear or anxiety or worry or uh, excitement or whatever it, uh, emotion you happen to have in the present moment. You can't help how you feel in the present moment. You know, you, you feel like this. Maybe it's not, then the, then the judgmental mind would come and say, oh, if you're feeling angry or, or lonely or whatever, you can pass judgment on yourself or blame it on somebody else, but, or you can actually observe it. It's like this. So Buddha Tat was always he, 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 I think, I don't know where I, I remember him saying if, if he was stranded on a desert island and somebody asked him, what would you do if you had, what would you take with you if you were stranded on a desert island? And he said, a, a little uh, medallion saying, Ben Yang Ni Eng, this is the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> And I always kept that in my mind, you know, like, you know, they have in, in, in BBC, you know, they have in England, they have this, this program called Desert Island Discs, where they, they have, uh, view some kind of famous person, and, and they have to choose what they would take with them on the desert island, if they're just, <laughs> what kind of music or whatever. <laughs> and so, so I, <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking of Buddha Tat, he'd just take a little kind of, maybe a medallion of sorts, or just a wooden chip with the, the way it is. Now, to contemplate that, because like the, you know, the thinking mind is a discriminative function we have, it discriminates. So, it, it, you know, it says this is big and small and right and wrong, uh, and good and bad. And so, the, the thinking mind is, is a divisive function in consciousness. So you're, when you're attaching to thinking all the time, to ideas, and you're always, there's always this sense of being separate, of, of division. It's the inevitable uh, result of attachment to conditioned phenomena, and especially to the thinking process, which which holds to very, you can create brilliant ideas, you know, like we should all love each other and be free and happy and and uh, democracy and and all the rest is all these high terms uh, and ideals that, that we can create, of, you know, where each person is loved and accepted for what they are and everybody's <laughs> keeping the precept properly and, you can create ideal monasteries, you know, where everything is, you know, in your mind. You know, you can create an ideal monastery where all the monks are practicing hard, keeping the precepts and developing metta practice, where we all get along and help and support each other and, and uh, work together in harmony and our credit to the Buddha, Dhamma Sangha and to Lumpur Cha. Thailand and all the rest of it. it's an ideal, beautiful ideal. But this is the way it is, you know, with, uh, you know, the, that you, even though you create an ideal, you can't, you can't make it happen. <clears throat> so the Buddha's emphasis on dukkha was observing that the way it is. So like in those early years with Lung Chan in the Wat Pap home, you know, there was I created a lot of suffering in my mind around things because I didn't understand, I misunderstood things, I had vipaka kama, I, I had attitudes of, of the, you know, from my own background and opinions and I liked some months, I didn't like others and I thought these, this was right and this was wrong. All the time, you know, in my, my mind I was creating suffering and then Mung Po Cha, his, his kind of, you know, even when, when I didn't understand the language very well, he could get me to reflect on that, on, on my own unhappiness or critical mind. And uh, 
opinions I would have about how they should practice and what they should be and all that kind of thing. So, so I began to get this this sense of being the pu ru, the uh, pu to style, where you you're observing. Because I couldn't help how I felt. You know, I couldn't make myself full of love and met all the time, and and uh, you know, I couldn't feel that. I could. I like the idea of it. You know, it's certainly a beautiful ideal, but the reality of the present moment is like this. And that's where, you know, I began to really appreciate the way Lung Pochon taught, because he was uh, getting me to look at what I'm actually feeling. He wasn't telling me what I should feel. Because <laughs> you can't tell anybody that, you, know, you can say you should feel this, but actually at this moment you're feeling the way, whatever you're feeling, it's, it's this way. Maybe it's not what you want, but it's like this. And so this is a reflective style where you're, you're, you're understanding dukkha. You know, you're really observing, and you're willing to to look at feeling, not in from the critical mind, but from the direct reality of it in the present. It feels because feeling arises and ceases and changes. It's continually changing. You can't hold on to a feeling and, and petrify it and stay with it, keep it, it changes uh, and because feeling is, is like this it's the anicca dukkha nata so this puru, this, this knowledge, this knowing, understanding coming from, not from uh, views and, uh, and opinions about Buddhism but from practicing uh, with suffering, its causes uh, the the end of suffering. Now this is this is a very you know this is a sim- very simple teaching. You couldn't find you know I've never seen anything that could compete with uh, with Buddhism Buddhist teaching for the first sermon he gave after his enlightenment. That's, that's as good as you'll get on this planet, you know, in, in something that's practical and, and isn't I, based on ideals and concepts that, that you can't prove to yourself. It's all based on your willingness to be honest and look and, be, and have this confidence in your ability to observe what you're actually feeling, but not judging it and saying, I am angry and I shouldn't be. That, then you're making more of it. But if you, if you're feeling angry, anger is like this. So what I'm doing now, just observing, I'm not angry, by the way. <laughs> but if I was, then there's a way of just observing. You feel it. You have the sense of feeling of uh, excitement or heat or whatever. Anger is quite obvious. You know, it's a, it's a strong emotion. Well, the difficult ones are the kind of when you when you kind of where sexual desire and anger aren't so much the dominant emotions you're feeling. They have to deal with doubt and loneliness and worry and wanting things, not wanting problems in your life, wanting everything to be something it isn't, and mm-hmm. wanting peace and harmony. You know. You know I remember monks in England, I say, all I want is peace. This kind of whinging style. We want peace. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> and the word peace became like, you know, like a sickening concept because, you know, it's like, but this realm that we're living in isn't peaceful. You know, the, the conditioned realm, nature is not very peaceful. And uh, the body, your body is never going to be very peaceful. You know, so you can tranquilize it at times and make it feel better. But, but peace is, is uh, what do you mean by that? And also, if, you're, if you don't know what peace is when you do experience it, you find it pretty bloody boring. Peace is really boring. So, you know, Monks are very good at, when they get peaceful, to then stir up things because 
make the life of the monastic life a little more interesting. <laughs> so, and I was at, you know, at the university in, in, in Berkeley, Berkeley, California, back in 1963, and there's all these peace movements. I used to belong to the Quakers, the American Friends Service Committee, and, and anti-atomic a peace committee, and we go on protest marches carrying placards and say peace. And then, uh, then suddenly, you know, here I was yelling, saying peace all the time, going on marches. But you know, then I suddenly realized I didn't know what I was talking about. I wasn't peaceful. I was asking the world to be peaceful for me, but I, I wasn't, you know, peaceful in my mind. That's when I inclined to become Buddhist monk, you know, because of the shock of realizing the hypocrisy of going around demanding the American government build peace in the world when I can't even do it myself in my own mind. So this is, uh, uh, you know, that brought me really to really see that I had to do something with my, my own mind. I just couldn't go around blaming President of the United States or the Russians or anything else for for wars and lack of peace when I didn't when I couldn't even do it myself. So then coming here to Thailand, you have this this uh, this sense of you know finding like teachers like Rung Kwa Cha and. You know, your Wat Pat Pong in those days was very uh, kind of primitive, with no, no kind of luxury, softness, or luxury. It was all pretty rough, and and uh, Ajahn Chah was was at his peak. I was very fortunate in being with him at his very best best years, <laughs> and uh, but he could also put you to a test, make things very unpeaceful for you. And uh, and you think used to think he should try to make everything peaceful for us. And then you, you see your own kind of wanting somebody to to make your life peaceful for you. But he never, you know, his way of teaching was never through malice or through through trying to upset people, but trying to help us to look at our own minds. And, and keep directing our attention at that uh, until we got until we actually had that kind of confidence, that insight. There is suffering. Suffering has been understood. Suffering should be understood. Suffering has been understood. So there, this is like uh, taking something. You know, there's nothing esoteric or precious about dukkha. It's, the most ordinary feeling we all have, every creature, you know, whether you're a caterpillar or <laughs> dog or cat or human, you know, they all have to live within the limitation of the forms that we're in. And, uh, and in, a, in a universe that is very, you know, vast and frightening and, and threatening, you know, we're sensitive, vulnerable creatures. And so, trying to create peace, make all that so it doesn't upset me or threaten me in any way, can't do it, it's impossible. But I can recognize peace through mindfulness. And so this is the whole way of the Buddha, is pointing to this sati sampatanya satipanya, and developing, just using this ordinary, human, banal, common experience of dukkha, suffering, and taking it, you know, so it's not like some high-minded, high, high form of philosophy. It's very practical, very simple, but very direct. And then if you follow the structure of the Four Noble Truths, you see for yourself. It's a, it works, you know, exactly if you follow that, that particular, that way of 
the second noble truth, third noble truth, fourth noble truth, but you're internalizing, you're not, you know, it doesn't take long to memorize the four noble truths, but, but to actually apply them and to see in your, in your mind, in consciousness, conscious awareness of suffering, the causes of suffering, desire, Attach, ignorance and attachment to desire. And this is a desire realm. This is all about the body's a desire form. You know, it's it's not your fault. It's just the way it is. <laughs> and you know, so we we're hungry, we're thirsty, we get tired, we want to sleep, we want to feel safe, we want to protect ourselves, procreate the species. This whole thing, your body's a form, is a desire form. And uh, so that's why the way of relating to the body has changed from put, put judging it in terms of right and wrong or bad, but observing the body, like the first study of Tana, kind of you know, where you're actually looking, observing the body for what it is, not trying to dismiss it or judge it, but observe. Now that knowing, that ability to observe, what is that? That's the puto, the, the, the ability that is what the Buddha is, this is the essence of the teaching, is to develop this awareness of the way things are, that all conditions are impermanent, all dhammas, there's no self in it, it's not, you can't, there's no personal dhamma or, you know, the, the personality, the sense of me and mine, is a creation through thinking, through grasping thoughts and memories and ideas. And so you move toward the empty mind where consciousness is empty and non there's non attachment. You can actually recognize through mind whose non attachment is like this. So you you know so you you have to know what attachment is before you can really appreciate non-attachment. So I used to practice, deliberately practice, becoming obsessed with attachments and then letting them go. But I could kind of discern that. Where before I was just trying to get rid of desire, it doesn't work. You don't get rid of it. And to think that I can conquer desire as a person you know, that just man is going to conquer his desires, get rid of them, is another ego uh, delusion. You'll never conquer uh, it through the personality, but through understanding it. So this is the understand, sati, sampachanya, panya, these are the words in the Pali, you know, they're quite, you know, it's a, you know, we translate them into English and then, then we think we understand them, but it's really sati from Britannia is, is not, when we're so caught up in views, opinions, ideas, or, and that then we, we, we don't have sati from Britannia. we're always, we might know what the Pali dictionary said, what great teachers have said, but you don't, it's a recognition of it through, through the Bhattipata, through the practice. But it's quite ordinary, it's not like a high state of samadhi or a kind of outer space kind of experience. It's the opposite of, of, of refined conscious experience. It's, it's empty, it's consciousness that's empty. Because, you know, consciousness, this realm is a conscious realm. And then you, when you're born, you're conditioned to, you know, to identify with the body, with the feelings and and uh, your parents and culture and so forth. So you condition after you're born. But before that, when a baby first born is conscious and has a has a human form. And then it's conditioned into becoming a little boy, a little girl or a Thai or an American or whatever. These things you know, whether you're from wealthy family, poor family, or whatever, these identities come through 
the conditioning process. When the, then with mindfulness, you begin to see through that, that those ways that we create ourselves and, and operate from particular uh, self-views, even in with Buddhism, until you, you're, there's this puto, this Buddha, this knowing, direct knowing, and then it's simple, what does the Buddha know? He knows all conditions are impermanent. <laughs> And all Dhamma is not self. Sape Sangrani Cha, Sape Tamanata. The Buddha observes in a difference between attachment and non attachment. He discerns a difference. Or suffering and non suffering. Or self and non self. Desire and non desire. That's the discerning of, of like an intuitive, I call it intuitive awareness, where you're. It's an intuition, you're observing it in a direct way, not through views or definitions you acquire from books or teachers. So then, it's the discerning ability, a spanya, you know, wisdom. In this Buddhist sense of wisdom, what, it, what do you mean by spanya? It's, it's like this is discerning, to know the difference between self and non-self. Then you can observe, you know, when I become a person, I become a self, I'm back in the realm of dukkha immediately. I'm self-conscious, I, you know, all the old habits of my conceits and vanity and that operate almost automatically. And then you non-self, you just say, anatta is like this. That's peaceful. To not be anybody or in, in a non-attached, to not be attached to conditions, but it's not a rejection of anything. It's a, an, a discerning awareness within the limitation that we find ourselves in at <coughs> every moment. So it's a, it's. They, I've been reading these books, these kind of little books that they publish now of Lumpu Dunes, Lumpu Far Wai. And Lumpu Dun, we, we were stopped when, when we were coming from Ratanawan to here. And yesterday we stopped at in Surin because I wanted to see it. it Lumpu Dun was a disciple of Ajahn Man. And, but he lived in the town, right in the middle of Surin. And uh, in a you know in a Bariati monastery, and, uh, and he lived most of his life there. But uh, his teaching, very similar to Ajahn Shah, very succinct, very brilliant kind of ways of reflecting. They're very good for reflection. So, so the, the because it is not about you know, analysis, I think. It's just very abrupt. And Thai language, of course, lends itself very well to that style, because it, <coughs> you know, it's, uh, it is a language that, that has very much uh, evolved through its uh, relationship to Theravada Buddhism. But the, these are really, you know, in, here in this country, you have really Excellent, you know, teachers, people that have, monks that have had these insights. They're not just coming from Buddhist philosophy anymore, but through actual direct experience, insight, knowing directly themselves. So this is like when Pancha was Tanaja Ajahn Mahamon, all these monks, you see, all the monks I trained with, they're all old now, kind of not very healthy looking. <laughs> Ajahn Vitun, he came today, he just had an operation. And he was one of my friends in the early years. And what about Paul and Tham Sang Pat? And uh, but 
you do recognize how if you stay with it like it does you know this once you have these insights what are you going to you know you, you're, you're in a form that really holds you gives you the sense of uh, living a life in modern society which is blameless and I can't think of any other way to live that would be as as skillful as this one you know it's because uh, it it's, it's not my creation, it's not my idea of what, I, what the Buddha taught is. It's a very traditional, very conservative uh, form of Buddhism, but, but actually the, it, for living your life, like living in, in England for 34 years, you could still live as a Buddhist monk without any, any great difficulties in a non-Buddhist country, in a European country. So it, it's not like it, you're just going against everything and becoming a real kind of pain in the neck and an oddball to the society. Actually, you know, a relationship to to England's English society was one of respect and and the, the sense of of giving opportunities and of blessings rather than converting and forming other cults and and divisive religious attitudes towards towards the society, because there's enough of that in the, in the UK, <laughs> in Europe these days, a hodgepodge of strong views about religion, for and against. So, I, but, you know, the, the, with this way of, we, we live in a, in a harmonious, you know, in a skillful, kindly way with the society that we're in. And it works, you know, it's not like you have to... I mean, there's a lot of pressure I experience to change it to fit modern ideas of how things should be. You know, because they, they want you to modernize Buddhism. <laughs> but because of the training with Lung Kho Cha and that kind of uh, value that he gave and I began to see uh, that, that the thing was that I couldn't change it without going outside the tradition I had to leave it in order to change it to what I what others wanted or what I wanted or particularly felt at the time so and it's important you know to, like this insight I needed to live within a structure that I had no control you know, I couldn't just manipulate and change it and modernize it and make it Western Buddhism or British Buddhism. I had to, you know, this is like this and, and keep going within that limitation without being, you know, a stubborn fool. But it's internalized so that you're, you're you know, you're you can see your own ditty, your own conceits around uh, about, you know, from your own cultural background and conditioning. So the aim is this empty, empty consciousness. Consciousness non-attached is like this. And then you can actually desist. It's very, it's peaceful. There's no self in it. And then when I, you know, become somebody, I have start thinking, I'm Ajahn Sumedho. <laughs> and on a level of, of uh, you know, the conventional reality, fair enough. You know, so you go to what bar we wait tamata tomorrow, and the, they say, Tenjo Kun, Rat Sumedho John, and all this, and this, this is the conventional reality. It's not like them, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's when we bind ourselves to conventional reality that we suffer. So conventional reality, you've got to live with your body as it ages and, and, and you know, gets those problems of age and that you all have to experience loss and despair and fear and all these are just emotions that one has in one's lifetime as a human being on this planet. But our relationship to it is of understanding rather than 
grasping and trying to, you know, run away or control or make it into something out of ignorance and willfulness. So tomorrow when we go to the the cremation ceremony, I encourage you to observe how it affects you. you know, I'm not asking you to feel anything, but but use the situation. You're in a in a thing. Well, maybe you won't understand what's going on half the time. Crowds of people, uh, ceremonies, and so forth, and and uh, you know, be thousands of people there, and. Uh, you know, for if you, you know, you don't really understand what's happening or going on or that, but that's okay, you know, you're just observing, it's like this. So that you can have your own views and opinions about, you know, is this necessary or you know, we don't like this ceremony, it's like not liking something like this. Or we, we just feel confused or impatient or uh, with it, mm. maybe we're we're fully with it. Maybe we really appreciate it, but, and it's like this: be appreciative uh, of uh, the respect and ceremonial aspects of Thai Buddhism. Is like this. So then, you're you're learning to center yourself in Bhutto, in the knowing of the way it is, rather than you know your own views about how you'd like things to be or not to be. Oh,